ever have one of those days where everything goes sideways before you've even finished your first cup of coffee? That was my reality, just a few ticks past sunrise, as I clocked in at the secluded facility nestled discreetly within the dense cover of Montana's Lolo National Forest. My name, not that it matters much amongst the covert circles I run in, is Ripley Voss. I'm a biologist, but not the garden variety kind. I work on genetic experiments so secret T, even mentioning them too loud, might warrant a stern visit from uptight suits. The day began like any other. I was triple-checking sequence alignments when Harlan Coates, our tech guru with the fingers of a concert pianist and the hair of a wild man, stormed in. Ripley, he gasped. Delphine found something gruesome on the west perimeter. Delphine Pratchett, ever the stoic field operative, rarely flinched at anything nature threw her way. We geared up quickly, matching black cargo pants and sturdy boots, whispering across linoleum as we paced through sterile corridors. Outside, the sun was too bashful to pierce the fortified pines, shielding us from prying eyes. Delphine met us by the main gate, her expression grim. Follow me she said curtly. We didn't need more prodding than that. By the time we reached what Delphine had discovered, the first whispers of horror were already unfurling within me, a sight as disgusting as it was baffling. A deer sprawled across our path but mangled in such bizarre fashion that it looked more like a cruel parody of taxidermy gone wrong. Harlan quipped an inappropriate joke about venison going to waste, inappropriate being his brand. But nobody laughed. We all felt it. Something wasn't right. With Harlan mumbling to himself and Delphine scanning for more clues, neither daring to verbalize their dread, I crouched down beside the carcass for a closer inspection. No ordinary predator had wrought this devastation. No human could achieve such precision with such savagery. Suddenly aware of how exposed we stood in a swatch of forest far away from any semblance of safety, I stood up briskly and checked my sidearm, a habit drilled into me over years on this unorthodox job. Not that a gun always helped against what nature might dream up. I don't like this, Delphine muttered, reaching for her own weapon discreetly concealed beneath her jacket. Let's report back, I suggested, when suddenly an ear-splitting roar shattered our uneasy conference, a sound no known creature could claim rights to. We turned instinctively toward its source, hearts impaled by primal fear as incongruent thoughts collided in our minds. Was this linked to our experiments? A byproduct of our tamperings we hadn't foreseen? The arsenal under our fingertips provided cold comfort against unknown monstrosities born from nature's wrath or perhaps our own arrogance. Pushing through branches that snagged at us with spider-like fingers, we sought sight of whatever beast owned that harrowing cry. Just then, Coates yelped as his foot found vacuous earth where solid ground should be. He staggered, but recovered quick enough not to kiss the dirt face first. It wasn't long before we came upon another chilling scene, one more hapless animal distorted beyond recognition, but this time with evidence suggesting an intelligent yet feral perpetrator at play. The air turned heavy with silent apprehension as daylight began its retreat, a tactical failure on our part, not securing the area before dusk crept upon us. Our hand signals spoke volumes. Spread out, but stay within eyeshot. The difficulty being every shadow now seemed pregnant with malice waiting to breach its umbra cage. I scanned every visual frame my eyes could capture fearing a repeat of literature's fabled wendigos or skinwalkers. Though my rational mind screamed there had to be logic behind these perverted displays, nature usually didn't dabble in modern horror mythos. We pressed on, keeping close but cautious of ambush. Sanchez motioned for a retreat back to the base. The need for reinforcements was clear as our numbers and weaponry were inadequate for confrontation. Signals crackled to life in our radios. Henderson spoke first. Base, we have an unknown hostile, 
Request immediate backup at our coordinates. Static hissed a response. Copy that. ETA 20 minutes. Panic held us when branches snapped nearby. I sighted the outline of something large and swift among the trees. Body lean and powerful. Covered with matted fur like a bear. But movements too graceful. Too predatory. Coats signaled from a distance. Pointing to a lower clearing. Look. I followed his gesture, noting body parts stretched between trees. We knew then what had screamed earlier. An animal, or even worse, human met its end. Our circle tightened as darkness grew near. Lights flickered on weapons and headgear revealing further shredded foliage and traces of blood leading deeper into the forest. No one spoke. The reality spoke for itself. The wait for reinforcements became a haunting vigil. A shape darted between shadows, silent except for faint rustles betraying its position. It happened in seconds. Coats screamed as the creature leaped. Claws sliced through the air as he fired blindly. I saw it then in full view, limbs disproportionate in length giving advantage in both reach and speed against its prey. Eyes reflected haunting red glints from our lights. Chaos ensued as bullets found their mark but not sufficiently to deter the creature's onslaught on coats. Realization dawned. This creature wasn't just defending territory. It hunted us, methodically. Sanchez shouted orders above gunfire noise. Fall back to the clearing. Keep your sights aligned. We retreated in formation while the creature pursued relentlessly. Injuries mounted among us. Henderson took a severe blow trying to cover our escape. Reinforcements arrived with louder gunfire and brighter lights pushing the beast back into shadows that birthed it. Regrouped at base, we accounted for losses. Henderson didn't make it out alive. Beside his fate lay heavy on our minds. The next day brought armed teams and trackers combing through detailed reports at hand. No sign of the beast except torn environs speaking silently of its reign of terror. Debriefings followed with experts proposing theories on possible species variants or mutations caused by natural anomaly or human intervention gone wrong. We kept silent vigils, weapons primed not knowing whether the creature lay in wait or if we'd invaded its solitary domain, triggering its savage defense mechanism. In end, my thoughts often circle back to these woods and what might still lurk within. A predator's no folklore or story could ever have envisioned yet undeniably real in nature's twisted scheme or our folly. It's not every day that your belief in the impossible gets challenged. Well, not unless your job involves dabbling with the very threads of life. That's what I do, or rather, what I did until things took a turn for the surreal. I worked at a secluded facility nestled deep within the forests of the Pacific Northwest, far from prying eyes. This is where the U.S. government conducted secret genetic experiments, and my name is Emmerich Lowry. My life was a cycle of strict routines and protocols until that chilly morning when my colleague Dr. Quintina Vogel rushed into the lab out of breath. Droplets of sweat formed a stark contrast on her pale skin as she managed to whisper, Something's gone wrong with Subject E57. It's gruesome. The facility went on immediate lockdown. An emergency meeting convened in the central hub. My team, consisting of Dr. Vogel, our security head Marcellus Hinder, and I gathered around flickering screens that displayed a horrid sight. Subject E57 was no longer in its containment unit. Whatever it was now was something else entirely. Its form reminiscent of a wendigo from Native American folklore, only with bone structures protruding like makeshift armor. As we debated our next move with growing apprehension, joking half-heartedly about needing the pay rise this kind of situation should warrant, alarms blared and radio chatter became frantic. Security personnel were reporting something large moving through the corridors. Chaos erupted when Marcellus received confirmation via radio that two guards had been found, 
or what was left of them. It wasn't pretty. Their remains painted a picture of marauding brutality I'd only seen in crime scene photos. We knew we had to act quickly and arm ourselves. Rifles were distributed as we set out on what felt like a hunt more than a containment procedure. Yet none of us truly understood the nature of what we were dealing with. We split up into teams, Marcellus leading one while Dr. Vogel insisted on joining me. Strength in numbers, she said, her voice trying to mask the fear we all shared. We're scientists, not soldiers, Quintina quipped as we checked our weapons once more before delving into the dimly lit corridors. Maybe today we're both, I retorted with an attempt at lightheartedness that fell flat in the sterile air. Moving cautiously through our own workspace now felt alien and threatening. This place that had been familiar for so long instantly transformed by this unforeseen horror loosed amongst us. Every shadow made us jumpy. Every sound was magnified until it seemed even our own breaths echoed like distant drumbeats throughout the expanse of tree-shrouded halls bleached by sterile light. Then, all pretense of civilization vanished when we rounded a corner to find it. This creature born from our tampering, mutilating another victim in the cold glow of fluorescent lights. The scene tugged at my stomach and twisted it into knots. Eyes wild and reflecting some unholy hunger, it appeared almost human if not for disproportionate limbs that ended in sharp, jagged points like nature's mishandled sculpting tools. The bloodstains on its chest could have been war paint, heralding its triumph over mankind's arrogance. Quintina and I froze. The creature looked at us with a sense that it recognized our presence as a threat. We couldn't fight what we didn't understand, and this thing before us was beyond comprehension. Back, I whispered, each word an effort to push out. We retreated, stepping over debris, our minds racing for escape routes. The creature, lost in its grotesque indulgence, paid no heed to the sound of our cautious steps. We reached the lab and barricaded the door. Quintina glanced at the phone, then at me. Signal's dead, she said, her voice strained under the weight of our predicament. The lab was a dead end, a place of research and progress now a potential tomb. Quintina moved to the cabinets, looking for anything useful. Our eyes met for a brief moment. No words were needed. The creature's shadow snaked into the room under the door crack. It was looking for more. Its silhouette seemed larger now, thicker limbs, sharper angles. I thought of calling out, screaming for someone to hear us, but realized that we hadn't seen any of our colleagues since... Since when? Time had become a blur of fear and flight. Quintina handed me a fire extinguisher, the only weapon we had against an inhuman force. We waited as the scratching on the other side grew frantic. Then it ceased suddenly. Moments stretched, neither of us daring to breathe too loud lest we attract attention again. With nothing but seconds ticking by... We made a decision. Quintina nodded toward the ventilation ducts. We removed the heavy metal grate and climbed through the narrow paths, emerging into another section away from our pursuer. Days passed as we hid and moved through our transformed workplace. We found ourselves in a server room on what could have been day three or five. Each moment felt indistinct from the last. The power flickered, the creature had damaged essential systems during its relentless search for prey. Mere survival kept us one step ahead of it, but every space we entered held an imprint of its presence, dismembered limbs or half-devoured remains. Since escape was not an option, Quintina suggested that we climb again into another set of ducts leading up towards maintenance access panels on the roof. It became clear to us, no one else was alive here to hear our cries for help. When we reached the roof, rescue greeted us in the form of helicopter searchlights scanning over this facility thrown into darkness amidst power failures, an island held captive by this aberration. Rescue teams secured us with harnesses, while one brave soul asked what had happened inside 
with a trembling voice that betrayed their dread of knowing too much. We don't know, I replied honestly, as I looked over at Quintina, who wore an identical expression of haunted ignorance. As we ascended away from that hellish sight below us, I realized then that there were things people were never meant to tamper with, that some curiosities leave scars deeper than physical injuries. The only marker for those lost within that place was silence, a void where vibrant life should have been, and in my mind would linger those hopeful faces unaware of their fate at the hands and appetite of something unknown and fierce birthed from human error. Whoever figured a trip to the vending machine could herald the onset of a nightmare clearly hadn't clocked in at the Hemlock Biogenetics Facility, nestled in a godforsaken forest in the hinterlands of Montana. It's not like you expect sunshine and lollipops working on government black ops projects, but nothing quite prepares you for Thursdays gone bat crazy upside down. My name? Call me Tanner Greaves. You won't find me on any of the usual rolls call or yearbooks. The kind of man who prefers his coffee black, his nights quiet, and his biohazard level 4 pathogens securely behind 3 inch thick containment glass. So, a stolen Twix bar was to blame for what came next. A mischief one of our lab techs, Arlo Petty, swore up and down he had nothing to do with. Wouldn't normally raise an eyebrow if it weren't for Petty's conspicuous wrappers strewn about his workstation, exhibits A through E of his chocoholic tendencies. The lab's unspoken rule, don't snoop around without cause. That went out the window when Petty stopped showing up for his night shifts. Something smelled fishy and wasn't just the microwaved leftovers from the break room. It's usually the quiet ones you gotta watch out for mused our security officer, Coraline Tress. Unpopular by name and by nature. Coraline had eyes sharp enough to lance through lesser lies, but this time, even she couldn't scratch past the surface. We had procedures for AWOL personnel, sure. But procedural rigmarole doesn't account for blood-chilling howls echoing from hemlock shadows after dusk. With dusk stretching its inky fingers over us quicker each day, it was only logical I'd end up trekking into these woods with Coraline on my six and government-issued sidearms, a piece of cold reassurance against whatever kind of hell had crawled out from our petri dishes to take Petty. Our search turned up sweet F.A. until we stumbled upon Petty's ID badge dangling off a bramble like some horror show Christmas decoration. The ground nearby was churned up something fierce, as if a brawl broke out, or worse, Someone had dragged something heavy, unwillingly, deeper into an abyss that shouldn't exist outside campfire ghost stories. Skeptic as I might be, the workaday world doesn't ready you to witness broken branches smeared with fresh maroon paint that your brain screams is blood. It just doesn't. Shout if you see anything, I called over to Coraline, though half hoping she wouldn't have cause to holler back. It might be... My tongue tripped over words deadlier than any slugs chambered in my glock. Because what if it wasn't petty or something equally mundane? What then? Dialogue text boxes ticked through different nightmarish theories until we reached an unnatural clearing where the moonlight didn't dare pierce the canopy above. A perpetual twilight zone for flora misguided enough to grow here. And there stood petty, or what was once petty, a macabre scarecrow skewered upon splintered wood. The sigh slipped silently between set teeth, as anger or resignation who can say. No screams rent our eardrums, since what do you shout when faced with grotesque tableaus nature never intended? Shouting means hope, of rescue or escape. This tableau whispered quite the opposite, but no time for despair's poison when shadows shifted, no spider ever wove darkness into form so monstrous. No lore chronicled creatures like these. Also like nothing scripted by God, nor Darwin's evolutionary penstrokes. 
not this abysmally misshapen pariah rendered in charnel cloth draped uneasily upon its frame whence human words would never fall. Logic argued it must have been born from our lab's enigmatic entrails, but still bore such stark strangeness that resisted easy classification as any known biological terror. I turned from Petty, not looking back, not wanting the image carved any deeper into my memory. The path through the dense forest seemed to constrict around me, as if nature itself grieved and sought to choke out intruders. Stumbling forward, I pushed through brush and undergrowth, each snap of twig like a shout through a library hall. There it stood, the creature from Nightmare's Edge, a form not cast from familiar molds. Broad shoulders hinted at power far beyond that of any man. Its skin was a shimmering obsidian that drank light and blurred edges. Eyes were absent from its skull-like face, and yet I felt its gaze. Hollow sockets that seemed to follow as I edged away. The communicator in my pocket was a useless brick. No signal could escape this place. Besides, who would believe this account? Words are flimsy traps for such horrors. It moved without sound sliding between trees like oil through water, a predator amongst shadows. Fleeing sparked the chase, turning away fueled its interest. Retreat was instinct, evasion my survival. It clawed at space where I had stood seconds earlier, thick fingers shredding bark as easily as paper. First it caught Miller with swipes that opened him as one might a fruit, wet sounds of separation marking his end. He gasped for words, but found none. We met eyes briefly before his light dimmed and there was little left to identify. Resisting the urge to clutch at his remains or scream my rebellion at the injustice, I ran. I kept forward momentum, darting past Reggie, who stood transfixed by fear, knowing his fate was sealed in my escape. A sharp yelp behind me signaled another loss. Then silence told of Reggie's report to oblivion, a tale untold save for the blood on leaves. When beacon lights finally broke through trees hours later, spotted by sheer dumb luck rather than skill, I emerged into a ring of uniforms and equipment that buzzed like an excited hive. Words failed me once again, yet they demanded them, taking in my battered form with questions painted on their faces. They searched the woods afterward, found signs of struggle and worse, but no beast of supernatural lore to pin them on. Medical personnel whispered, bear attack, and shook their heads, but the coroner looked puzzled while stitching up the dead. Unnatural patterns danced across torn flesh that didn't match any bear he'd known. Days passed as they do. Life moved on outside those cursed woods. Funerals were held, Petty's empty casket most haunting for its hollow weight. Miller and Reggie's families clung to each other frothing at how random cruelty had snatched their loved ones away. The scar marks on trees made headlines for days until something more tangible took their place. People need something solid to fear, not phantom claws in the dark or voids where answers should lie heavy and neat. I live with eyes now drawn perpetually to Horizon's line, as if expecting dark forms to take shape in casual glances where light still fights shadow valiantly each dusk and dawn. The only vigil I can keep for friends swallowed whole by a world hungry and vast beyond comprehension. Those final moments before humans fade unanswered sit with me still. Steel gray aftermath where once laughter rang clear. Vision blurred by images better left unseen. Clear-cut knowledge stained deep within that some secrets keep themselves with teeth sharp enough to cut curiosity clean from bone. Out there, it waits still. Silent, chaotic void with presence implied rather than confirmed. Steward of questions without form. To prowl scenes that we fabricate but never truly understand or control. Leaving only memories like graffiti marked upon life's walls. Here there be monsters. Ever had that prickling sensation creep up your spine at work, like you're in one of those horror movies and you're the character who's about to get it? 
Me too. Except this wasn't Hollywood. This was deep in the heart of Oregon's lush forests. And I wasn't an actor. I was a bioengineer named Jasper Eklund. Our job at the secluded government facility was to monkey around with genes that could revolutionize medicine, or so we told ourselves to sleep at night. The lab stood inconspicuously against the dense backdrop of evergreens and ferns, a metallic anomaly hidden away from the serenity outside. My colleagues were a motley crew, Tilda Koenig, our microbiologist with the wild hair and disposition to match, and Grover Hitch, the guy you'd trust more with a petri dish than a conversation about the weather. One late afternoon, we were huddled around watching cells dance under Grover's microscope when an ear-splitting scream echoed through the corridors. It was Tilda. We dashed out, nearly tripping over each other. The scream wasn't just petrifying. It had this jagged pitch to it, like nails on chalkboard, that suggested something very wrong. We found nothing but her notes scattered on the floor and an open rear exit door swinging in the wind, leading out into the forest. With no cell service and our nearest help miles away, calling for assistance wasn't an option. Heck of a time for her to play hide-and-seek. Grover tried to lighten up the mood, failing miserably as we peered into the darkening woodland. It felt straight out of a twisted campfire tale. Grabbing flashlights and my trusty Glock, just in case wildlife got too curious, we initiated a search pattern through thick underbrush and overgrowth. We shouted Tilda's name until our voices were hoarse. No response ever came. An unmistakable stench hit us before we saw it. Something was dead nearby. A fresh kill. Not uncommon in the forest, but chilling given Tilda's disappearance. That's when we saw it perched in shadow. A grotesque semblance of something human but twisted by foul play with nature. Elongated limbs wrapped in tattered clothes that could have been Tilda's lab coat. Grover gasped beside me but kept his wits. If that's a bear, I'm Elon Musk, he muttered, probably louder than he intended. I could only think to say something about how bears didn't wear lab coats or look like they stepped out of mythology text, but my heart hammered against my chest so hard I feared it might leap out. The creature's sharp eyes glinted like knives as we locked gazes. A grisly tableau surrounded us. Trees marked with deep gouges and ground torn up beneath our feet. I didn't need to be Sherlock Holmes to connect dots that suggested this beast had something serious against nature itself, or things trespassing its territory. Grover Veni Vidi Vici, I jested nervously as we stood back to back, trying not to think of what Vici might entail with whatever lurked just beyond our flashlight beams. What happened next has haunted my nights ever since. A shrill cry pierced through other night sounds, a colleague's voice barely recognizable after piercing fear had laced through it. And then, there was silence again, thick enough you could slice it with Grover's microscope slides, if only he hadn't dropped them when that thing made its first bone-chilling growl. I grabbed Grover's arm and whispered, We need to make a run for the car. No sooner had I spoken, then an immense shape charged out of the darkness directly at us. It was huge, covered in coarse fur, its eyes reflecting the dim light from our flashlights. I did not have time to make out more details. Survival instincts took over. We broke into a run. The creature gave chase. Its heavy footsteps thudded behind us, each one echoing like a gunshot through the night. Branches snapped under its weight, as it barreled through the underbrush with an almost mechanical preciseness. We ran hard, breath heaving from our chests. Grover slipped once, but I pulled him up without halting our pace. Our car lay a good mile down an old dirt path we'd taken into the woods, and with each step, that mile felt longer. The path ahead was rough. Roots threatened to trip us, and several times we narrowly dodged low-hanging branches that reached out like clawed hands. But we could not waste precious seconds on caution. Speed was our only advantage. I dared to look back just once and caught sight of dark fur shifting between trees. The creature was closing in. Grover saw it too. 
We won't make it, he gasped out between labored breaths. There was truth to his words. Our legs were burning from exertion, and the car seemed no closer than before. Then Grover yelled suddenly as he fell, his ankle caught between two hidden rocks. I turned back, pulling him up, but when I glanced back again, the creature had vanished. We listened for it but heard nothing over our pounding hearts and ragged breaths. Why weren't we calling for help? Simply put, there was no time. Reception was a dream in these thick woods, and by the time help arrived, if they even found us, it would be too late. Time passed slowly as we stood there, listening, waiting for the creature plagued by an insatiable rage to re-emerge from the shadows and end what it started. But it didn't come back out. I supported Grover as best I could, an arm slung around my shoulders, and we stumbled forward once more. The thought, never far away, that every step might be swiftly countered by whatever horror lurked here. Somehow, more by luck than anything, we made it back to the car unscathed, though what happened to that colleague of ours remained a mystery neither of us wanted to solve. I fumbled with keys before revving the engine alive, a sweet mechanical roar after all those organic sounds of terror and we didn't stop accelerating until city lights replaced shadows and civilization drowned out traces of wilderness madness. Days passed before local authorities investigated, only after our frantic calls about a missing fellow scientist prompted them to do so. They found some remains later identified as Cora's. She must have been the cry we heard that night, and termed it an animal attack. Some species undocumented but real enough to leave scars both physical and otherwise on those who encountered it. Grover quit fieldwork after that night. He bore witness to something unnatural, or at least unexplained, and preferred laboratories where variables were confined to petri dishes since then. As for me, well, I don't venture into deep woods anymore either. Survival guilt lingers like early morning fog even when sun shines overhead. Cora did not make it while we did, but there's no rhyme or reason behind most of life's cruel twists of fate. You know that unsettling feeling you get when things are going just a bit too well? That was the sense tingling in the back of my mind as I arrived at the sprawling, hidden compound nestled deep within the dense Okfenoki Swamp in Georgia. As a geneticist working for a discreet wing of the U.S. government, my days often blurred into a series of experiments and reports that most people couldn't even begin to fathom. My name, Creedon Hollis, doesn't come up much outside of classified files and nondescript badges granting access to high-security areas. I spent my days splicing genes in search of medical breakthroughs, or at least, that's what I was told to believe. Co-workers like Elspeth Rundle or Barnabas Keeble were smart cookies. We shared uneasy jokes about mutating into superhumans to cope with our morally gray work. We laughed, but nobody truly relaxed in a place like this. The lab was silent, except for the hum of equipment when I walked through the sterilized halls to reach my station. Just another day, or so it seemed, until I found an unexpected note on my desk. Check the West Wing containment area. Anomaly detected. Anomaly? We used such words for minor issues, not crises. Yet there was an urgency to this scribbled message. Passing through several security doors, I reached where we held our more volatile subjects. The air felt tighter here, heavier with unasked questions about what we were really doing, all under the guise of patriotism. Suddenly, without warning, the power went out. Emergency red lights flickered on as shouts pierced through the darkness from several corridors away. My heart raced, not out of fear, or so I told myself, but from conditioned alertness. In this soundless chaos, isolation gnawed at me with cold teeth, reminding me acutely that help was not an option here. Protocol demanded silence unless absolutely necessary. A bestial growl from deep within the containment cells washed over me with chilling certainty. 
an orchestrated event had begun unfolding. Gun at ready, provided to all personnel as reassurance, I moved towards the source cautiously and practically unnoticed, which was not particularly comforting. I found Elspeth hunched over a console, trying to restore full power. There's something loose, she spat out between keystrokes. No further explanation needed. We knew exactly what implications lurked within those words. The air suddenly grew thick with metallic stench as Barnabas staggered towards us from another corridor. His white lab coat splattered with an artist's palette of crimson and scarlet hues. His usual playful smirk was replaced by an expression wrought by sheer terror. We have to lock down the facility. He gasped his last words just before his body thudded onto the cold floor. A darker pool blossomed around him while we stood frozen in horror. Elspeth and I exchanged glances. Our unofficial code for this is really happening. With adrenaline as our silent partner, we scrambled through dimly lit rooms toward where containment once thrived, a now shredded semblance of security. As we advanced cautiously through debris-strewn hallways, sounds of primal savagery echoed off walls that had once seemed impervious to nature's untamed wrath. This wasn't any predator known to man or beast. It was as if folklore had grafted itself onto reality creating a chimera that defied logic, yet demanded belief through sheer force of presence. Elspeth briefly locked eyes with it, a glimpse enough to etch its visage into nightmare for life, before firing rounds in desperate defiance against an opponent she couldn't begin to comprehend but knew well enough to fear. Elspeth's gun clicked empty. We turned and ran. The creature's roars filled the echoing corridors behind us. We reached a door marked Secure Calm Room and threw ourselves inside, slamming the heavy metal shut tight. I bolted it and turned to Elspeth, her face white with terror. We need help, she said, panting hard. I agreed and moved to the console. The line was dead. Our isolation was complete, location unknown to most, deemed unreachable for our own safety when dealing with what we termed outliers. But safety had become a phantom. Elspeth checked her weapon. We have to find another way out. We left the room silently, checking each corner with caution born from necessity rather than bravery. The sight of it appeared again at the end of the hallway, swift movement and a blur of dark fur edged with dripping wet crimson from its last encounter. It was large, easily twice the size of a bear, but moved with a predator's grace that no bear could match. It charged. Elspeth fired a flare toward it, not in hope of injury, but distraction. For a moment its eyes reflected a brilliant red before it leapt away into the shadows outside our sight. We keep moving. I spoke now, trying to sound certain. As we navigated through the facility's labyrinth and lower levels, the systematic destruction was undeniable evidence of its wrath. We stumbled upon our co-worker James, or what remained of him, in Lab 3C, his eyes wide open in surprise more than fear. Elspeth turned away. Her throat worked as if she wanted to say something but thought better of it. We found an exit beneath fallen debris in what used to be storage. Daylight filtered in weakly from above, providing just enough light for us to climb out from our technological tomb into fresh air that seemed foreign after hours below. As we hauled ourselves out into the woods surrounding our facility, we noticed an eerie silence. No bird song or rustle of small creatures in underbrush. It seemed they too had sensed or witnessed this new apex predator's dominance over their domain. After hours of walking and avoiding any sort of path that might circle back to our nightmarish origin, we stumbled onto a logging road and were ultimately found by confused but concerned loggers who contacted authorities after noticing our distress and serious injuries. Weeks later, they told me researchers concluded it could have been an undiscovered species, maybe pushed towards aggressive behavior by some external factors like disease or loss of habitat, mere speculations for what we encountered that day. Survivor's guilt weighs heavily on me, but brings with it responsibility. 
to tell the tale so that others may learn from our unpreparedness against nature's darker surprises, and mourn those lost in naive arrogance that some facilities can contain what should never be caged. It was the sort of mechanical hum that makes you think your ears are playing tricks on you. A constant, low-frequency vibration that seemed to be coming from the very earth beneath my feet. Working for the U.S. government on secret genetic experiments at a secluded facility deep in the forests of Northern California had its fair share of odd moments. But this was different. My name's Remo Barone, a lab tech by trade and an inadvertent sleuth by circumstance. That morning, we were introduced to Lev Grossman, our new head of security, an enigmatic figure with piercing blue eyes that scanned everything with meticulous skepticism. Lev's presence was commanding, and his lack of words matched only by his ability to convey everything with just a look. Most of us found it unnerving, especially Jared Manko, our lead researcher who never missed a chance to break the ice with a joke. If looks could kill, we'd need a new security head every week. Developments at the lab were always on a need-to-know basis, which meant we rarely knew anything until it was directly in front of us under a microscope. But that sound... It didn't take long before Lev and I were searching the facility's perimeter, guns securely holstered at our hips. No amount of training could prepare us for what lay beyond the tree line. A trail of devastation cut through the woods, trees uprooted, earth gouged as if by massive claws. Lev signaled for silence as we moved closer to investigate one particularly large crevice. Throwing in a glow stick revealed something horrifying. Remnants of what appeared to be tissue samples intermingled with metallic fragments. What kind of experiment could do this? Lev whispered, more to himself than to me. We heard rustling, sudden and close. Weapon in hand, Lev motioned me backward, when out from shadow emerged Dr. Sheila Kavinsky, her lab coat marred with grime and blood streaks. She was visibly shaken, but managed to spit out her encounter before collapsing. Its skin, like an old folktale, not human. The facility blared into lockdown mode immediately after we stumbled back inside with Sheila. As per protocol during breaches, no outside help could be called. Containment and secrecy were paramount above all else. As night fell over the forest canopy like a shroud, Jared joked uneasily while bandaging Sheila's wounds. Guess even Mother Nature doesn't want us messing around in her backyard. The attempt at humor did little to cut through the growing tension. Scouring over video surveillance yielded no images beyond an amorphous blur that seemed both part of the forest and yet foreign to it. A creature from local folklore, perhaps? A being that should not exist per natural law yet left behind tangible carnage? Weapon drawn once more, I roamed the now dimly lit corridors towards where the creature had last been seen on camera. Every shadow seemed animated by some unseen force. Every slight creak from metal heating or cooling now signified potential movement. Just then, control room alarms blared, reporting multiple breaches along various sections of the compound's infrastructure. The unknown assailant wasn't acting randomly. Its movements were strategic, intelligent. Jared radioed through panicking breaths while barricading himself within Research Lab 3. Remo, it's going through walls as if they're paper like it knows exactly where. The radio cut off abruptly mid-sentence, followed by deafening silence as if all life itself had been sucked out from around me. I froze. The silence after Jared's last words hung thick in the air. I resisted the urge to call out for him. It would reveal my position. Instead, I backed slowly toward the nearest exit, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of movement. A sudden commotion outside drew my attention. Screams from my colleagues mixed with a sound that resembled ripping metal. I edged towards a window and risked a glance. A large figure moved with unnatural swiftness, tearing apart barriers as though they were made of cloth. It stood at least eight feet tall, 
Its skin appeared to be a mix of rough textures similar to bark and stone. Muscle rippled beneath the surface as it moved, each limb ending in what could only be described as claws, sharp and efficient. Radiostatic brought me back to focus. I pressed the talk button. Evacuate immediately. No code for this scenario existed. Improvisation was all that was left. In a blend of planning and instinct, I sprinted to Lab 4. There might be a flare gun there. Upon entry, I noticed Marie lying motionless by her desk, her body mangled in a way that no fall or accident could cause, confirming she wouldn't need the flare gun anymore. Without hesitation, I grabbed the gun and dashed out of the lab toward the southern emergency exit, away from where that creature was last seen. Outside, under the scant moonlight, I let off several bright red flares into the sky. It was all I could do as a signal for help outside of our compromised communication system. Then I ran into the woods in the hopes of finding shelter until rescue arrived. After hours spent hidden within an abandoned ranger station, dawn approached and with it came the sound of helicopters and shouted commands through megaphones. An extraction team found me just as daylight began to repel the night's shadows. They asked about survivors or what had happened, but I could only shake my head. In debriefing, they mentioned finding just one body, Marie's, confirming no others remained at the compound. Now safe at a temporary facility, people in suits asked questions about security footage and creature behavior, but all remained speculation without solid evidence or understanding. Church bells from nearby towns rang for those lost unsung heroes, while we survivors nursed our grief silently, offering respect to their memories without words. The story ended not with comprehension, but with acknowledgement. Something unknown had crossed paths with us leaving behind chaos and prompting endless questions about what lurks unseen alongside us on this planet we thought we knew so well. Ever have one of those moments that make you realize just how mundane your morning coffee routine is? I was about to experience a disturbance to my daily grind that made instant coffee seem thrilling. I work for the US government in a secretive role that involves genetic experiments. Specifically, my tasks are carried out at a facility hidden within the sprawling forests of the Pacific Northwest, so remote that even Google Maps gives up trying to locate it. My name is Mustafa Lemkin, and I'm no stranger to the bizarre and unexplainable, but what transpired was unlike anything even my extensive clearance could rationalize. My colleagues, including Jovita Keen, an expert in bioinformatics, and Dragan Ruzik, whose skills in molecular genetics were second to none, were with me when we found something particularly unsettling at the edge of our research perimeter. Dragan was examining something half-buried under crimson-soaked leaves, his brow furrowed. Mustafa, you ever see something like this in our work? He asked in his thick Eastern European accent. I crouched beside him to see a patterning of flesh and fur mangled in such a way that it resembled avant-garde art if one had a particularly grim taste. This wasn't an accident. It was calculated, dismemberment with precision that was chilling. Critter wars getting wild out here, Jovita offered dryly from behind us, her attempt at lightening the mood only making the hairs on my neck stand on end. Returning to our lab bunker meant trekking through the thicket where whispers from the wind felt like warning mutters. It was on one such return trip, our radio crackled with panic, an assistant from another department reporting sighting something near her station. Her last sentence cut off with a scream followed by silence cursing under our breaths, guns in hand, government issue for our unexpected wild neighbors. We hurried towards the location she'd described. Our comms were down. We couldn't call for backup or even alert anyone to what was happening. We found her workstation abandoned, papers fluttering into the wilderness like frightened birds taking flight. A trail of destruction led deeper into the woods, broken branches at unnatural heights, 
and footprints unlike any wildlife indigenous to these parts. With each step further from safety, tension craved release in brash decisions, yet we moved with purposeful stealth. Awareness heightened, as though every sense had been sharpened by fear itself. I didn't sign up for fieldwork, Dragon muttered, his words almost a whisper against the backdrop of encroaching darkness. Nobody signs up for this kind of fieldwork, I responded, though my voice lacked conviction, a joke falling flat as if absorbed by impending dread. The trail ended abruptly before us as we emerged into a clearing illuminated by a natural skylight framed by towering pines. The clearing seemed untouched until I glimpsed something move, fast and fluid in the corner of my eye. A flash of what appeared like amalgamated animal features, yet utterly unfamiliar. It had detected us, too. Our unseen adversary seemed pervasive, the embodiment of every whispered folklore tale where wild things roam outside men's domain. Yet this was flesh and blood. It bled when Dragon's bullet grazed it after it lunged towards Jovita, who had strayed too close to its hidden vantage point. She fell back with a gasp while the creature retreated back into cover. Dragon checked his weapon as I pulled Jovita to her feet. Blood oozed from a gash on her arm where the creature had struck. We were scientists, not combatants, ill-prepared for an assault by an unknown entity in a forest that had turned hostile. Mobile phones showed no service, a dead zone in the wilderness. We need to move, I said, probing our retreat path. Dragon nodded, helping Jovita along as we retraced our steps. The creature could be stalking us. Its dark silhouette was a blur of fur and muscle that could outmaneuver us with ease. The trek back was silent except for our hurried steps and the occasional rustle in the underbrush. We kept our gaze fixed behind us as much as forward, anticipating another attack. As we cleared the densest part of the woods, Dragon's foot caught on something. He fell forward, cursing under his breath. A trap, an improvised snare of sorts, had been set up with cunning simplicity. We cut him free but found no sign of our assailant. It was near dawn when we stumbled onto the road where our vehicle waited. We drove straight to the nearest hospital for Jovita's wound and contacted local authorities thereafter. The response was skepticism masked by feigned concern. They noted, but did not act. Days passed in a blur of medical checks and debriefings with faces that expressed disbelief at our account. Members of our research team departed one after another until solitude became my companion. Jovita moved to a different city. Dragon took indefinite leave from work. The incident left each of us altered, unable to reconcile our reality with what we faced in those woods. Official reports cataloged the encounter under unidentified animal attacks, though nothing like it had ever been documented or even rumored to exist. The forest reclaimed its silence as if nothing had ever trespassed upon its tranquility. I found no peace. Sleep gave way to restless nights and work became a distraction that barely managed to hold back the memory of those harrowing moments. But life had to continue. Unanswered questions lingered as whispers among leaves, a language without translation, an experience undocumented yet undeniably real. We never returned to those woods, nor did we speak again of what happened that night. Our scars were remembrance enough. Jovita's wound healed, leaving behind faint lines etched into her skin, as if nature itself wanted us never to forget our transgression into its domain, where something lurked beyond human understanding. That flash of movement remains etched in my recollection. A creature birthed from Earth's hidden crevices with features defying categorization. A reminder that some secrets are closely guarded by nature's impassive facade. And sometimes... They reach out and touch those who dare tread too close. There's always a fleeting moment, right before your alarm blares for the day, where life is nothing but a serene dream. 
That sliver of peace was shattered the minute I set foot into the dense woods surrounding the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory on Long Island, where I work. As a geneticist for the secretive government-funded initiative codenamed Project Lycan, my job was to tinker with genes most dared not touch. Among my colleagues was Zephyr Kreutzer, an odd man with a knack for virology, and Echo Yarwood, whose work on gene splicing had won a multitude of clandestine accolades. Communication in our facilities was always brisk, professional, and sprinkled with dark humor. If our test subjects ever got Tinder profiles, Echo mused, they'd swipe right and you'd wake up as a bat. Things shifted one serene evening when Zephyr failed to report to his station. As protocol dictated, I went looking for him. The lab was secure, but it's what lay outside that unsettled me. The sprawling woodlands seemed to envelop the silhouettes of night in a curtain of darkness. Logic dictated he wouldn't wander there without reason. It wasn't until I found his lab coat near an unauthorized access hatch that led to the forest perimeter did that gut-punch feeling hit, a silent alarm we all have for when things don't align with our understanding of the world. Armed with nothing but my keycard and an unsteady breath, I ventured outside. My flashlight cut swaths through the nocturnal symphony of rustling leaves and distant animal calls. The quietude felt oppressive, more so when I stumbled upon streams of blood leading towards an unknown destination within the woods. Now here's a simple joke. How do you track a bleeding scientist in pitch dark? You listen for the curses about his ruined white coat, or you find something far worse wearing it. To call what I saw wildlife would be sardonic even by my standards. It was as if childhood nightmares were born from local lore about beasts lurking in deep woods and given flesh, an unholy amalgamation of man and beast coated in carmine satire. My skepticism wrestled with raw terror when its gaze locked onto me. Every rational particle of my being wanted to call it a bear, a distorted mirage, but I knew bears didn't move with such deliberate malice or have eyes that flickered with human intelligence. In a moment all too vivid yet surreal, it charged, and instinct took over. My firearm an indulgence equally shunned in scientific circles as it was necessary given our work, came to life in my hands like an omen I'd yet to understand. Echo's words from days past taunted me now. Our creations can always tell their maker. Was this creature chasing me, another result of science marched grimly forward without ethics? Clarity was scarce, as its growls choreographed a horrifying dance amongst twisted trees while bullets matched its steps. More than once it swiped at me, a warning each time. It wanted not just my life, but whatever semblance of reality I clung to. My escape became primal maneuvering, ducking under clawed arms covering ground etched in deathly intent. Between desperate calls broadcast on our secure comms begging for backup and gasping pleas for survival lay an uncomfortable truth. Help wasn't coming because they couldn't hear or refuse to believe. The chase broke into a cleaving silence only dread could whisper over. History was replete with creatures part myth, part revelation. In this shadow-drenched chase through labyrinthine wilderness lay cold implications beneath every momentary reprieve from violent pursuit. A glimpse at my watch revealed hours had passed, or maybe just seconds, Time distorted when chased by fables wrought real, a mockery of humanity's reign over nature. Lungs burning fiercely against cool night air could not douse the heat within, as unanswered questions propelled my flight deeper within brush and bramble, an elusive safety seemingly always one step ahead. Each labored breath drew sharp contrasts between cultivated control within laboratory walls and wildness personified hunting doggedly at my heels. The potential end weighing heavily like Zephyr's abandoned white coat, heavy with crimson expressionism mocking in gruesome artistry. I pressed on, the thorns lashing my face and arms with each desperate step. I clutched my side where the creature had caught me, warm wetness telling tales of a wound deeper than I dared to inspect. It would have to wait. 
ahead, moonlight seemed to reach for me through the dark canopy, promising thinner forest and possibly a road. I should have called for help when I first heard that dreadful sound behind me. But in the fog of panic and disbelief, the concept of reaching out slipped away like sand through fingers. The radios we carried became decorative at best, the static humming a useless lullaby against this living nightmare's roar. The sound came again, a guttural snarl that seized my attention, willpower the only shield against its chilling effects. I glanced back. Two eyes gleamed like coals at dusk. Its shape was hulking. A dark silhouette, mercifully not yet fully defined by my terror-stricken gaze. Its forelimbs were disproportioned in length, built for reaching rather than running, and ended in claws that tore up earth with each unchecked swipe. Skin glistened as though coated in some filmy mucus, catching errant rays that filtered through the trees. Another growl, close enough to feel vibrations underfoot. This wasn't the time for thought or heroics. This was raw instinct about survival. I broke into a clearing and glimpsed roofs, a welcome sign of civilization, maybe safety. Lights painted feeble hopes across my mind's canvas as I stumbled toward the possibility of refuge. The chase continued down narrow alleys, me always just ahead of malevolent intent, manifesting in destructive pursuit. Houses lined my path but stood lifeless. Had they heard and barricaded themselves against this horror? Or was it just too late? Near collapse from exertion and blood loss, I reached a town square where lights shone brightest, perhaps hope personified in these darkest of moments. The creature lunged one last time but collided with something unforeseen. A car had swerved into its path. Metal clashed with flesh, an ugly symphony heralding momentary reprieve as the creature reeled from impact against something more tangible than fear or flight. People emerged then. Voices rose to assemble reality from nightmare shards. Bystanders turned rescuers moved toward me, while others faced down the now grounded terror with tools turned weapons. Wade! Over here! called out a familiar voice. A colleague missing from our expedition team returned from seeking help upon realizing we were overdue. Emergency services swarmed soon after, crawling over one another to attend to wounds or quell lingering alarms stirred by surreal events. In hospital linen later, authorities questioned me between gentle prods at memory's tender spots, trying to paint veracity on an unbelievable canvas, a creature they could not classify terrorizing their quiet existence. They never found it despite searches that went on for days after. Only evidence remained, the torn metal carcass of a car and copious trails of dark ichor leading back to whatever abyss birthed it into our world. We gathered once more as a team some days later. Even those injured insisted on attending this strange wake of sorts, for normalcy turned fiction by force unheard till now. Speculations spun wild as tired minds tried reason, but ultimately found none. This beast wore no label science could claim, nor lay trodden paths folklore might whisper tales about. Just cold fact in form, indescribable now forever etched into each survivor's tale, recounting abject horror faced and somehow overcome despite logic's protest display. I always took pride in being a man of science, the kind who requires empirical evidence before jumping to conclusions. That was until I found myself amid an incident that defied all logic. I, Caspian Holloway, worked for the U.S. government at a secluded facility in the dense forests near Hoodsport, Washington. Unpopular as my name might be, my existence became far less significant when compared to the harrowing ordeal that would unfold at my workplace. It was just another day at the lab. Sterile white walls echoed with the hum of machinery conducting secret genetic experiments. My colleagues, each bearing similarly obscure names like Dr. Theta Kellerman and Agent Lyle Creedy, were immersed in their intricate tasks. 
That placidity was violently disrupted when Lyle burst into the lab, pallid and panting, his eyes wide with terror. Something's out there, he managed to choke out between gasps. Theta scoffed lightly. Maybe Bigfoot came for a visit? But her attempt to lighten the mood fell flat on our anxiety-riddled minds. In all my years working there, nestled among whispers of eldritch wildlife and old wives' tales, not once had we encountered more than an occasional bear. But Lyle wasn't one for unfounded claims. His fear felt tangible. With firearms at our disposal as standard protocol for researchers in remote locations, we agreed to investigate outside under the assumption that it could be a trespasser jeopardizing our clandestine work. Emerging into the dimming light under the canopy of towering pine trees, we tread carefully on a blanket of fallen needles. Somewhere beyond our visual thresholds lurked a presence, silent but oppressive. It started subtly. A few mangled rabbits here, their bones fractured so precisely it seemed surgical. Black bears can be real scavengers, I remarked dryly when Dr. Kellerman's brow furrowed at the sight of a shredded fox not far from where we stood. The further we ventured from the safety of our facility, spattered blood began painting a gruesome breadcrumb trail towards something worse than we could have fathomed. A partially devoured deer lay sprawled before us, its entrails strewn across leaves and soil like grotesque confetti and its somber eyes still open in silent scream. What could do this? Theta whispered, as she knelt to inspect the grisly scene with an analytical gaze reserved previously for petri dishes and not nature's mangled canvases. Our answer came sooner than expected. Movement rustled through the brush with a deliberate slowness, heavy steps that birthed shudders upon delicate fallen leaves, steps that sounded calculated, we never saw it fully, only glimpses of antlers that seemed unnatural in both size and shape attached to what should have been a creature from childhood nightmares or forgotten lore. Its breath was audible against the backdrop of our hastening heartbeats, ragged and heaving like bellows stoking some internal fire fueled by malice rather than wood. None dared shout for help knowing well that radio signals faltered in these woods, and doing so would likely sign our demise by drawing unwelcome attention from this entity whose very existence mocked our understanding of nature. Is this some genetic experiment gone wrong? Lyle pondered aloud with no trace of his earlier jesting tone while gripping his pistol so tightly his knuckles whitened. Before any of us could frame a response or theory that didn't sound torn from pages of pulp fiction, it struck with such ferocity it seemed personal, not merely animalistic hunger, but something relentlessly vindictive. A blur of shadowy fur punctuated by unnervingly intelligent eyes charged towards Agent Creedy, who had hardly enough time to raise his weapon before being barreled over by strength no mere man possessed, his screams punctuating what would become an erased afternoon amidst federal secrets. What happened next? was chaos incarnate. Gunfire erupted as seconds transformed into desperate eternities where survival hung by frayed threads. Threads tugged mercilessly by a folklore specter turned flesh and blood antagonist whose name remained unspoken, yet felt ancient upon tongues too numbed by fear to even whisper them. We scattered. Lyle and I dashed behind the dense trunks, Bullets from Creedy's gun, followed by a sharp yelp, told us he'd hit the creature, but not for long. The woods echoed with its growls and snapping branches. Radio won't work, and that thing's between us and the trucks, Lyle gasped, catching his breath. Agent Creedy wasn't visible anymore. The implication was clear, but neither of us vocalized it. Our hope had vanished with him. We moved counting on silence over speed to keep us hidden. Then it struck again, targeting us with terrifying precision. A wall of muscle hit me from behind, knocking the wind out of my lungs and sending my radio flying out of reach. Through blurred vision, I saw it, broad shoulders, matted hair like a bear, but its face... That face was wrong. Twisted features that no bear has. It didn't linger. 
it seemed satisfied with the damage done. Through sheer will, I got to my knees, saw Lyle motionless a few yards away, his leg bent at an unnatural angle. Radio. Too far. Yells would tempt fate. We knew this creature tracked sound. With muscles protesting, I half-dragged myself and Lyle towards a nearby cave we'd passed earlier. There was no rescue plan. This wasn't about heroics. This was about surviving one more minute. Then another. We spent what felt like hours in the cave's mouth as daylight started to fade outside. The creature prowled nearby. We heard it in the way leaves crunched and branches broke under its weight. When darkness finally settled and animal sounds resumed their nightly chorus, we realized, whatever this creature was, it had withdrawn, perhaps sated or called by some unknown instinct back into the depths of the forest. With dawn came silence, an eerie kind that spoke of emptiness. Somehow during those harrowing hours, while we laid there hoping for obscurity over discovery, whatever hunted us lost interest or moved on to other unseen business within these cursed woods. Profitless to linger on what must have happened to Creedy, or how this incident would be scrubbed from official records, we focused only on escape. Crawling and limping with what strength remained in our battered bodies, we found our way back to base camp by mid-morning. Help arrived shortly after our story spilled out in frantic bursts, agents documenting every detail while medics looked after injuries that would take more than time to heal. They treated Lyle seriously, his leg broken so severely it may never regain full strength again. Creedy. There was nothing left but a memory that would haunt me long after protocols erased evidence of his existence. In debriefings that followed where reasoning stumbled over logic's edge into realms unexplored by laws of science or understanding, rooted in reality as we knew it, they labeled the encounter a tragic animal attack, a tale so mundane it insulted those who endured it. Yet as I sit here now, away from those woods that hide a truth none ought to know, a truth glimpsed in dark fur and unnaturally knowing eyes, I understand why some encounters defy explanation, why some secrets insist upon remaining just so for sanity's sake more than anything else. Lyle spends his days in recovery. He doesn't walk yet without support. Creedy's family mourns a lost son courtesy of some unfortunate mishap. As for me, there are things best left unspoken things, seen only within boundaries where shadows cast longer than life itself, where creatures dwell which bear no name, lest calling forth invites recurrence. And quiet endures, a silence not empty but filled with whispers among trees between lulling winds, not unlike sighs from spirits whose stories remain unsung outside boundaries of these woods wherein I now refuse entry.